Good afternoon, and thanks to everyone for uh, turning out this afternoon. Much appreciated. I'm Craig Aaron. I'm the president of Free Press, and I want to welcome you to the next big thing, how public media innovation is changing journalism. We started Free Press eight years ago to amplify the public's voice in policy decisions shaping the future of the media. We believe that mobilizing the public at critical junctures is what's needed to bring about real change. And I believe we're at one of those critical junctures right now. So much of the debate over the future of journalism has been obsessed with the new, new thing, a nifty payment system, a shiny device, a better search engine, more corporate synergy, perhaps a rich uncle, um, or maybe one of those cyborgs that can write 10 blog posts a day, tweet, shoot video, and doesn't need to eat lunch. Um, but I believe the foundation of that better media system we're searching for, uh, one that provides our communities with the news they need, already exists. It already includes a national network of TV and radio stations, it already includes hardworking journalists, and it already includes some of the most exciting, forward-looking, and innovative media projects that are already underway, which we're going to hear about here in a bit. This is public media, and when I say public media, I do mean the BBC and PBS and NPR, but I also mean community radio, low-power FM, public access television, non-commercial websites, and much, much more. And as if we've looked at this problem, this crisis in journalism, we've studied policies and tax credits and new business models that are supposed to contend with it, we keep coming back to the same conclusion. And that conclusion is that the best answer to this problem is more public media. Now, public media are far from perfect as they are today, but I'd like us to imagine for a second what public media might accomplish if they were better shielded from the whims of Washington and the relentless pressures of Wall Street. Because at the very moment public media are needed most, they're in jeopardy. Uh, but imagine if instead of wincing in anticipation of that next blow from Capitol Hill, uh, that we were actually debating how to reinvent and reimagine public media in America. Imagine actually trying to learn what's working elsewhere in the world and imagine actually listening to the public. Because you wouldn't know it from the debate that you often hear in Washington, which is mired in the fallout from sacking this commentator or the other or some doctored videos. Uh, that in reality, surveys show that the overwhelming majority of Americans, Republicans and Democrats alike, supports public funding for public broadcasting. Surveys show again and again that they think it is the best use of their tax dollars than anything but the national defense. In fact, I, there was this one survey I saw the other day. Uh, I was asking people, now public media is so in the news, how much of the federal budget do you think goes to public media? And the, the people said 5%. I mean, we're hearing about it about that much. Now, 5% of the federal budget, of course, would be $190 billion with a B. Uh, so we're not quite there yet. Uh, but the interesting thing about that survey was that even at those levels, or whatever people perceive those levels to be, even then, they still supported public media spending. They still believed it was crucial. So, of course, we actually spend, you know, just something over $400 million, which works out to that $1.50 or $1.37 per capita. Now, our friends uh, here from England, uh, they're spending closer to $90 per capita. So, at this time, when the need for public media couldn't be bigger, I think the support couldn't be broader, we're still spending pocket change. And at a moment when public media outlets could be driving innovation, we're starving them. There are more than 30 million public media listeners, public radio listeners, every week. There are something like 60 million public television viewers. There are 6 million people out there who support their public or community media station financially, and they vote. But for the most part, we don't ask them to do anything except give it pledge time and maybe make a call to Congress when things are truly, truly dire. But what if instead of only calling them when we're really in trouble, we actually engage them in the process of turning our essential but embattled public media system into the world-class one we need? What if we treated them not just as consumers, but as creators? And what if we recognize that they are not just the audience, but that they are also our allies? I think if we showed them the best innovative ideas, I think we should also be challenging them to come up with even better ones. 
I believe that journalism is a public good and essential to an informed citizenry. And I believe that real democracy is impossible without those reporters out there on the beat telling us what's happening in our communities. But if democracy requires journalism, I also think that journalism requires democracy. And that is an engaged citizenry demanding the serious work that holds our leaders accountable. And if you want innovative journalism, if you want a world-class public media system, then you're going to need innovative policies and innovative organizing strategies to make them a reality. And more importantly, you're going to have to start listening to the innovators inside the public media system, alongside the public media system, and from around the world. Hopefully, a little bit of that will start here today. I want to turn over the mic briefly to the organizer of this event, who's Josh Stearns from Free Press. He leads all of our journalism and public media program at Free Press, and he's going to introduce today's speakers. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Craig. And um, as Craig said, my name is Josh Stearns, and I do direct our journalism, public media, and media ownership work. You can see it housed over there at savethenews.org, and you can explore uh, all the different policy issues we work on via the tabs along the front. Um, if you're tweeting this event, uh, you can use the hashtag, hashtag save the news. At the beginning of this past year, as debates raged on Capitol Hill about the future of funding for public broadcasting, we actually released a major report on public media and political independence. We have copies of that report in back, or you can get it uh, at savethenews.org. The report was authored by Rodney Benson and Matt Powers from New York University, and it was the first of its kind uh, inventory of 14 democratic nations and the way that they fund and insulate their journalists from political influence. What the report found was that with the right political firewalls, public broadcasters around the world are producing high quality, diverse programming and airing critical investigations of their governments. In fact, in every single case that we looked at, all 14 nations, public broadcasters provided more and higher quality public affairs programming and a greater diversity of perspectives than their commercial counterparts. However, that same report found that public media institutions around the world and the governments and citizens who fund them are grappling with what their digital futures are gonna be. And that was really only a footnote in that report. Like, looking into the future, we see this is a coming problem. We're going to note it in this report, but we didn't do much more with it then. So one of the greatest challenges facing public broadcasters is defining what public service media looks like in the networked age and navigating outdated funding models and policies that might inhibit innovation and transformation. For this reason, we wanted to focus today's event and today's conversation on this intersection of public broadcasting and innovation. There's great opportunities and very real challenges ahead of us, but there are passionate people leading the way, and that's why I'm so excited about our panel today. I'm very pleased to introduce Caroline Thompson, the Chief Operating Officer of the BBC. And I want to start out, hopefully not stealing her thunder, by quoting a recent speech that she gave, uh, which really speaks to the importance of innovation during tough economic times. She said, if we are going to continue, <clears throat> if we're going to continue the open, I'm sorry, if we're going to continue to maintain the public's trust, we have to accelerate the ch changes we are making by, by openness and honesty, by listening carefully to audiences, and by delivering even greater value for money. By traveling even faster on this journey of change, we can make sure the BBC remains a touchstone for great British creativity. In difficult times, the British public wants to remain central to their lives and to the life of the whole UK. Accurate, impartial, creative, original, and passionate about what we do. Now, more than ever, here in the US, across the pond in the UK, and all over the world, we need public media. But as Caroline notes, we need public media that doesn't stand still. Standing still is not something Caroline does very well. She has been working in broadcasting for more than 30 years and has produced a wide range of shows for the BBC, including leading the BBC's World Service. In her current position, Caroline oversees a long list of responsibilities, including policy and strategy, marketing and communications, legal, editorial policy, business operations, and technology at the BBC. She's led the BBC through its transition to digital and worked to renegotiate the license fee, which funds the BBC's operations. No small feat. So please welcome me in joining Caroline Thompson and, um, <clears throat> for her remarks.
thank you very much indeed, Josh, and uh, thank you very much indeed to the Free Press uh, for organising this event um, and giving me such a write-up. I feel I've got quite a lot to live up to now. Um, it's, uh, I'm particularly pleased to be here today uh, because public broadcasting uh, is a shared endeavour across the pond. And I know we have different traditions, and uh, it was uh, emphasised to me over lunch uh, how we have been, uh, we the BBC have been established much longer, and therefore uh, that explains a lot of the differences I think in in the role of market intervention uh, between Britain uh, and the United States. But nonetheless, I feel very strongly that the culture of public broadcasting is one which we all share, and which is an understood language uh, between those of us here today. Um, it's not greatly known, actually, but the BBC itself uh, owns much in its origins to the to America. Uh, the BBC was actually established initially as a commercial company, the British Broadcasting Company, and was a collection of uh, radio uh, set manufacturers uh, and uh, commercial players. Uh, two of the six were American. General Electric and Western Electric uh, were two of our key first shareholders uh, before we were turned into the BBC. And uh, you might think that uh, with that, the, uh, the sort of uh, slogan that the BBC would be work, work to, certainly in Britain, you might, they might think that uh, the slogan the BBC would work to with that sort of heritage is, have a nice day. Uh, but um, the, the, perhaps the more appropriate one, and indeed the other one which struck me very strongly uh, when I was thinking about this speech, uh, is one which I'd just like to quote now. Broadcasting represents a job of entertaining, informing, and educating the nation and therefore should be distinctly regarded as a public service. Now those phrases, entertaining, informing and educating, are ones which are written across the, through every member of the BBC as inform, our task is to inform, educate and entertain. Uh, but that quote did not come from John Reith, the BBC founder. It came from someone who I think will be familiar to many of you in these rooms. Uh, I now realise he was a general, General David Sarnoff, uh, the radio, the American radio pioneer. So I feel that not only did uh, American companies help found the BBC, but that founding thought about inform, educate and entertain and distinctly public service uh, was one which we all shared as well. So a shared endeavour with a clear public purpose. Uh, perhaps, uh, and it obviously was generally accepted uh, in the 1920s, uh, and indeed on through and certainly in Britain, uh, post-war into the 60s and 70s. But now... What I sense from uh, the talking to a number of you over lunch and over the last two or three days here uh, is a sense that uh, public radio, public broadcasting as a whole, radio and television, uh, is under threat and under question uh, in a way that it's never been before. Uh, and that certainly has been the case uh, in, the, in Britain as well. I know that uh, you had uh, very recently uh, a serious attempt in Congress to uh, cut the stipend uh, available to public television. Uh, which uh, had to be, uh, was actually voted on, as I gather, in, in the uh, uh, House of Representatives. Uh, in, in Britain, uh, we faced a lot of pressure to keep the licence fee flat, uh, and uh, we're making £700 million cuts, we've just announced last, last week, in the BBC's operations, in order to cope with that. We've also had more widespread uh, criticism uh, in Britain of the role of public service broadcasting, with an attempt always to push us, the BBC, uh, from being a big player into being a much narrower, 